Hey, welcome back to the channel. In this video, I'm going to talk about how Jehovah's Witnesses are like more ancient Christians. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses like to think that they are the re-establishment of first century Christianity. And, you know, there are some parallels there, and I think it's worth exploring. But in this video, I'd like to use what I think is a more accurate comparison. And that is that Jehovah's Witnesses and the organization is like the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages. There are four points of similarity I'm going to go through, and they are, number one, the organization is extremely authoritarian and manipulative, and it crushes the human potential of its adherents. Number two, they are not allowed to understand the Bible, but merely agree and regurgitate the dogma that's given to them. Number three, one of the greatest crimes one could commit is dissent, which is dealt with in a similar way. And number four, a new invention just might disrupt their iron grip. Okay, so the first one, the organization is extremely authoritarian and manipulative, and it, it really crushes the individuality and the potential of the members that make it up. Historian Will Durant said of Martin Luther that, the man was immeasurably better than his theology. Now, I really feel the same way about Jehovah's Witnesses. There is really quite a lot to admire in the group. There is certainly praiseworthy aspects to it, and this is particularly so with the people who make it up. There's a lot of unexplored potential uh, within the, the movement, and really it's uh, a leadership issue about how or whether that is developed and explored or not. Now, when it comes to uh, you know, laws or procedures or you know bureaucratic rules that really you know stifle people or hurt them in some ways, um, it's interesting to compare what the historian de Tocqueville said about France just before the revolution occurred there. In describing his own country, he recounted how barbarous laws may be established or maintained in a civilized age when the leading minds of the nation have no personal interest in changing them. What the Tocqueville is talking about here is that despite the fact that France was reasonably prosperous and advanced, and in fact just before the revolution in France it had pretty much the freest nation in Europe, and yet there was still some very, very oppressive rules and the regime just did not want to let go of certain uh, uh, oppressive tactics that they had over their population. And it was just simply because the leading minds of the nation had no interest in changing them. It wasn't in their best interest, or so they thought, to do that. Now this is very comparable to Jehovah's Witnesses. They have many quite backward and archaic rules that really stifle people, that attempt to pigeonhole them into caricatures of who they think a good Christian should be, and it really just smothers people. And it, it constrains people's ability to be their authentic self. And so the the rulership of the Watchtower organization is authoritarian, it's autocratic. And the witnesses call it theocratic, okay, that's just a euphemism. Um, it really is a totalitarian system of control um, that really has no interest in loosening its grip on the people it controls. Because if they admit that things need to change, then it's really an admission that they were making mistakes. And that's quite difficult for a group of people who have assiduously cultivated the reputation of soon-to-be immortal kings in heaven. It's hard to kind of step back from that and to admit your frailties and your weaknesses. Now, when it comes to the MO of the governing body, it's really quite similar to the Pope of the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages. He was quite literally a kingmaker. If the Pope did not sanction the 
rulership of a certain king in a country, then his legitimacy as ruler was open to question. This essentially is the MO of the governing body, but just in miniature. They have a tenuous empire across the entire world, and it's nothing like the so-called uh, Holy Roman Empire, but the authoritarian structure of the organization is very, very similar, and nothing can get done. Nobody can make a decision unless the authority always trickles back to the governing body. And if they say something, then it's done. And the recent activities around the Kingdom Halls and signing them over effectively to the Watchtower organization is really a, a very, uh, I think, poignant example of that. All the governing body had to do was just click their fingers and they just established, they probably just doubled or tripled their entire property portfolio. And it just required one simple decision from them and anyone who dissented paid a heavy price. The authoritarian structure of the organization is also quite similar to the uh, Catholic Church when we see the bait and switch tactics uh, they use when it comes to their belief system. Now, the Catholic Church for a long time pretty much held exclusive control of the scriptures. And they kept the scriptures in Latin which most people didn't speak. And so what they were able to do was hide the contents of the Bible and then impose a dogma on their adherents. But what the, the witnesses do is they allow people access to the Bible and how could they not? It's just something they could not deny people in the current age. But what they do is indoctrinate people with the idea that only they have the ability to understand it. Now, if you convince someone that only you have the ability to understand a text, it makes the text redundant. What use is the text? It doesn't have any use. You are now the sole authority. This is a bit like when a king goes on a, say, foreign trip, or he is incapacitated somehow, and a regent or a visor is put in his place. This regent or visor is the de facto king until the real king returns. And this is what the governing body have done. They have set themselves up as the only mediation between God and his word. And so they have effectively become God himself. They have set themselves up as gods, despite the fact that they don't claim infallibility. You don't have to claim infallibility. You just have to set the structure up so that no other option is available except for you to explain God's text to other people. And also with regard to this, um, this fact of doctrine, you'll find that when they are criticized, the response is usually very defensive, very reactionary, and very intolerant, just like the Catholic Church was in the Middle Ages. In 1762, the Archbishop of Paris was just so distraught about the constant attacks upon the Catholic Church that he wrote a 29-page tract and ordered it read to all in his diocese. Now, I understand 1760s is not the Middle Ages. I grant you that, but I do think this is a very interesting and a fair comparison about the manipulative tactics of the Catholic Church and, and comparing it to the Watchtower organization. Now, in this 29-page tract, um, which was ordered read everywhere in Paris. Uh, the Archbishop said that 2 Timothy 3, the prophecy about the last days, was in effect, and he suggested that these attacks on the church indicated that the end was near. He said this dangerous information risked seducing the mind and corrupting the heart. It pretends to go back to first principles of knowledge, he continued, and mixes great truths with great errors. This is exactly the same kind of fear-mongering and manipulative tactic that the governing body uses. Any criticism of the organization is dressed up to be this dastardly and cynical manipulative attempt to uh, hurt the faithful and mislead people. And it's, it's, it's how people 
It's how people are controlled. If you want them to obey, make them afraid and make them be very suspicious of outsiders. Make them think they're under attack. Okay, so on to the second point. Uh, They're not allowed to understand the Bible, but only to regurgitate the dogma. Now, medieval Christians, for the most part, had no access to the Bible. It was written in Latin. Most people didn't speak Latin. And the church, of course, then imposed their own dogma upon the population that, to some extent, bore little resemblance to what was in the Bible itself. Now, as I already mentioned, the witnesses don't employ the same tactic because the Bible is just freely available to everyone, practically. I mean, if you ask a witness, they'll give you a Bible for free. But what can't witnesses do? They can't just pick up the Bible and attempt to try and understand it. They can't decide where to get authoritative information about the Bible. They can only go to one source. And so witnesses find themselves, strangely enough, in a very similar position to medieval Christians. They have no freedom to use their own power of understanding. The Pope, the modern day Pope, the governing body, simply imposes a dogma on top of the scriptural text and tells their adherents, this is the only valid way to understand this. Just like in the medieval times, the Catholic Church kept the Bible in Latin so that people literally could not read it. And if they couldn't read it, they couldn't understand it. But the modern version of it is, well, you can read the words, but you don't understand it. Only we have that special ability. In fact, when the Bible started being translated into modern languages, the Catholic Church started to switch to the very same tactic that the governing body uses today. When John Huss was brought before a judicial committee, he claimed that he should have the ability to interpret scripture himself. The church argued that scripture must be interpreted not by the free judgment of individuals, but by the heads of the church. Sounds quite familiar, doesn't it? The same situation befell Martin Luther when he was hailed before a judicial committee for daring to understand the Bible for himself. He was addressed like this. Martin, your plea to be heard from scripture is one always made by heretics. You do nothing but renew the errors of Wycliffe and Huss. How can you assume that you are the only one to understand the sense of scripture? I find this response really quite amazing because the hypocrisy in that statement is really quite startling. The Catholic Church was saying, Only we can understand the scripture. And then they criticise Martin Luther by saying, how dare you say you are the only one to understand scripture? Apparently unaware of the irony that they in fact were doing exactly the same thing. Point number three. One of the greatest things you can do is dissent. And dissent is dealt with in a very similar way. The infamous inquisitions of the Catholic Church are very similar to the judicial committees of Jehovah's Witnesses. It was an occasion where several men judged an individual with the presumption of guilt in secret, where they were judge, jury, and executioner. The accused, no matter what the end result of the Inquisition was, was ordered never to speak publicly about what went on in the Inquisition. In Spain, um, people were under obligation across the entire country to report any act of apostasy or heresy to the church authorities. Now, the only significant departure with modern day judicial committees and the Inquisition is the use of physical torture, which of course would be illegal today. But Jehovah's Witnesses take it as far as they possibly can within the law. The ultimate aim of these judicial committees and inquisitions, of course, is one and the same thing. It's control. You cannot allow your authority to slip out of your hands. You cannot allow the power of your dogma to be diluted in any way. It has to be enforced. The historian Will Durant called the inquisitions a mental suppression unparalleled in history. 
Between 1480 and 1488, roughly 100 people a month were burned at the stake for apostasy, with 10 times as many given lesser punishments. Instructions from the church read, No man must base himself by showing toleration toward heretics of any kind. Jehovah's Witnesses will find this attitude very, very similar. They are constantly indoctrinated with a fear of apostates. Simply people who no longer hold the views that they used to. And purging apostates and silencing them is viewed as a purification, as a necessary, they even describe it as a loving act to protect the faithful from the diseased and corrupted uh, mindset of people who now disagree with the governing body. The tactic behind it is really similar to all kinds of authoritarian regimes, and that is you stamp out dissent as soon as it manifests itself, and you make the price as high as possible for defecting. Okay, and the final point, a new invention just might disrupt the organization's total grip on its adherents. It was actually the printing press, arguably, that eventually chastened the Pope and fundamentally altered how the Catholic Church uh, used and directed its authority over people. The Church called the printing press a mechanical vulgarization, and they feared that it would allow the propagation of subversive ideas, and that's exactly what it did. Once information could be printed in bulk and distributed at large in the language that people understood, ideas could get out there, they could mingle, and they could filter through the population, which really was devastating to the authority of the Catholic Church. Now, this is precisely why the governing body constantly warns its members about the dangers of the internet, as they call it. Now, the internet is full of information that's dubious and that it, many, much of it is false and misleading, but witnesses are conditioned to think that any information they encounter on the internet that differs with the governing body must be dangerous and must be wrong. And it is really quite possible that this new technology, the internet, might just chasten the governing body and other high control groups in the same way that the printing press did to the Catholic Church. Now, the organization may well change in time. I certainly hope it does. Um, it's not going to come from any real desire to help its adherents, but more likely from a political calculus of survival. If they want to maintain the organization's integrity in an age of information, they will probably have to pivot significantly from the authoritarian nature and the, and the coercive implementation of its dogma. If they don't do that, um, it's very likely the organization will shrink considerably. Okay, so there are just four ideas about a comparison between medieval Christianity and uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, thanks for watching this time, and uh, I'll see you again.